I don't speak till you tell me. I can talk to people here. So apparently we aren't yet switched on. So just to say thank you, those of you who come physically, it's easier to sit in your office or at home and watch it on the screen, but it's much, much nicer when you come. And also you can ask questions. And I feel I'm talking to actual people. It's a big difference. So I hope I don't put everyone off by the second lecture and you never come again. Professor, we're ready whenever you want. OK, you're ready. I'm ready. So I don't know how many people are participating in this lecture from other places. And some will be participating in a few hours, because this course is actually a joint. It's been announced jointly from the two places I work for in Trieste, which are the ICTP and CISA. Uh, which combine in ICAP, the Institute of Geometry and Physics, which I'm somehow affiliated with. Whether it exists or not in any actual form is not too clear to me, but it's slowly existing. But I also have a visiting position, like usually it's a month a year, in China at the Southern University of Science and Technology in Shenzhen. And this was meant to be the joint course, and we were hoping to do it at 11 in the morning here, or 12, so people there could see it, but because of the restrictions on the Budini Hall, it has to be at, at 4, from 4 to 5.30, which takes it to practically midnight in China. So some people will be watching it tomorrow, or tomorrow morning. I say hi to those two, to my friends in Shenzhen. So this is a, well, you've presumably all seen the announcement on both website and in emails. And as of today, there's also a poster that I've only seen on my screen. I haven't seen it on the wall. Very nice. And it gives all the details, which are that the course is meant to be for six weeks, so twice a week, each time an hour and a half. And maybe I'll write that, although I'm sure you've all seen it because it was on all of the announcements. But just so the first four weeks, uh, that's again because of the availability of the Budinich Lecture Hall. It's Tuesdays and Thursdays, as today, from 4 to 5.30. And then the last two weeks, uh, you can work it out yourself. It's written in the announcement, but it's not very difficult. And obviously, when it changes, I'll, I'll announce it during the course, not to forget. Now I've forgotten. Is it 2 to 3.30 or 2.30 to 4? I'll put 2 to 3.30 with the question mark. Maybe it's 3 to 4.30. Maybe I don't put anything. Anyway, by that time, you'll know, or you can look at the announcement. So the main thing to know about this course is that it's got only one objective at all. It's not to teach anybody anything. It's to have fun. I want to have fun. I want you to have fun. These are methods which are very useful in one's everyday life as a mathematician or a mathematical physicist. But a lot of them are simply fun, and sometimes even funny. And asymptotics is, is like a very, very human thing. It's not a very abstract part of mathematics. It's you can, as a second year undergraduate, can understand essentially everything. But the most sophisticated researcher needs, the, needs it all the time. Since I've started getting kind of in love with the subject, which is for many years, I've used it more and more and more and more different ways. And I would say every day, I use at least one or two of the methods I'll talk about in this course, most of which nobody except my friends that I've shown it to knows. They may be in books. Some aren't in books. But most people, if they have a sequence of numbers and have to figure out how they grow, they use mathematics already, in my view, a mistake. And then they make a graph. So let's say you have a sequence of numbers a n, and you've calculated the first 1,000 of them. So, you know, a1 is, I'm just going to invent some numbers. And then a1,000 is you know, 6.72. But they're quite expensive to calculate. You could calculate another 1,000, but it would take a day. You can't calculate a billion of these numbers. And so what many people do, honestly, this is frankly basically so dumb that you would think no one would do it. But I know lots of people are doing it, including very, very smart people. They take Mathematica. They make a graph. Here's A1. And then by the end, it's you know, 6.72. And then they eyeball and they say, oh, it's growing. Let's say it reaches 6.9. So you get you know, like one decimal, which may well be wrong. If you do it correctly, and you have these, let's assume these numbers you have to high precision. With 1,000 numbers, typically you can get 200 digits of that extrapolation. You can do it extremely accurately. And it's a very, very simple trick. 
that's one that I use at least once a week, if not once a day. But that's one of many topics I'll talk about. So asymptotics are fun. The course is meant to be fun. And that also means you, that includes people who are listening by Zoom and have to uh, you know, raise their hand or do something. Everybody should ask questions if anything is unclear, which will happen all the time because it's me. Or if I speak too fast, which will happen all the time for the same reason. Uh, if somebody could just raise their hand and say, could you go through that again? Or, give an example or, or just speak more slowly or take off your mask so we can hear you. For instance, there's no danger of infection when I'm standing here. I completely forgot. So feel absolutely free. It's meant to be informal. And uh, especially the people who are physically here should be completely free. But also, if you're watching online and want to ask a question, I just talked to, the, to Mark, who's the technical person. He has said, nobody is muted. So you can just switch on your microphone, or it is switched on. You can just ask. You can also, if you're embarrassed or not sure, you can ask a question by chat. But I won't see it. I'm obviously not reading the chat window. So then you still have to say loud into the microphone, I have a question in the chat window, then I can look. So really feel free to interrupt. So as I said, there'll be 12. Uh, it's six weeks, times uh, each time an hour and a half. So that's meant to be two hours. but with a 15 minute break, which we'll have after the course, so that it doesn't mean, mean the technical people have to stay over time. So this is meant to be two times a short hour. So I'll try to make a brief break in the middle. If I forget, maybe somebody could remind me and say, could you please shut up for a few minutes so I remember. But roughly, it's, it's six weeks, so 12 lectures. And I have a number of topics, and some of them will be for two or three lectures because they're more interesting, more useful. Some might be only half a lecture, and some will probably run out of time anyway. So for today, at least for the first half, maybe for the first, for the whole double hour, I want to give a kind of an overview of the course. What are some of the topics that are going to come? But also some of the aspects that should make you, you know, aware why you should care about asymptotics. And, uh, and, and, and you know, what there is to look forward to. So let me start with the philosophical remark. I, as I get older, I get more philosophical and make general observations about the sociology of mathematics. And one, I have several examples, but please don't ask me for the others, because this morning I couldn't think of any of the others. But I've thought of three or four examples in my life, at least, where the same concept occurs in mathematics in two completely different contexts. And the people in the two contexts have naturally different names for it. They see it completely differently, but it's mathematically the same. And sometimes there are people, or even many people, or even all people, who know both. But they don't notice that it's the same, because they're, they're in different compartments of the mind. They have different names. And so the only one I can think of, I have other examples. I couldn't think of one this morning, so please don't ask. Maybe by next time. The example I thought of is formal power series. So a large part of this course will be about It'll almost always be about power series. So power series are two things in mathematics. First of all, they're functions, which have an expansion, the Taylor expansion of a function. So you think of this as a, a function. And I remind you that a function is not something abstract. It's an operation which assigns to a number another number. So then this series should actually converge if it's actually a function. If x is a number, I want this to be a number. We all know the criterion. More or less, it's not. Well, it's sometimes there are series which are hard to decide. But roughly, if the terms blow up, it's not going to converge. And if they go exponentially to 0, it will converge. And essentially, any power series except for one limiting value is in one of those two classes. So this is either a function or a formal power series. So. Let's say that the coefficients are in C. I mean, they usually will. Sometimes they'll be in, in Q, but anyway, or in R, but contained in C. So it's just an element of C of x. Now, I know from experience and from courses, even here in CISA, in CISA and in ICTP and in other places, that there are many people, graduate students, but also more advanced researchers, who are frightened of asymptotic power series. When you write a series like you know, sum n factorial divided by x to the n, and you say you have some function uh, which has this asymptotic expansion at infinity, 
to me, that's a very simple statement to follow, but there are people who get frightened. They say, what does that really mean? Since, after all, this is a function, and there should be another function. The ratio of the two functions should tend to one, but, but it's not a function. And kind of they know, but they don't feel comfortable with the divergent series. So that's one thing we learn. We all learn the word divergent asymptotic series or formal power series. And we learn it as a purely formal thing, but if you think that numerically, with x being a number, it makes you very edgy. On the other hand, there's also something else, which is the word smooth. Now, I don't know any mathematician beyond you know, second or third year undergraduate who's even remotely terrified by the word smooth. Some functions are analytic, which means at every point, let's say on the real axis, they have a power series, a ta they're a Taylor expansion, co converges in some neighborhood and gives the function back. And some functions aren't analytic, but they're still smooth. They're C infinity. So those are synonyms. Everyone knows that. C3 would be three times differential. Smooth usually means infinitely smooth. And nobody's worried about that. And so you have a function, which uh, here's a graph of the function. At some point, it has a value, which is well-defined. It has a slope, which is well-defined. It has an oscillating parabola, which is well-defined. In other words, it is a Taylor series expansion to the zeroth order, to the first, to the second, to the third, to every order. And it's simply, if, if f of x, now an actual function, function, not something formal, if it's, it's called, is uh, analytic at x equals x here, as we all know, if the Taylor series converges, so I'll just write it out, fn of x0 over f n factorial times x minus x0 converges and equals the function for x sufficiently near uh, in some neighborhood of x0. But on the other hand, it's smooth, or smooth, or c infinity. It's c infinity if uh, f of x tends to some limit a0, as x tends to x0. Then since there's a limit, I can try to differentiate by subtracting that value just at the one point and dividing by x, or by x minus x0. And this should tend to a1, et cetera. And this will give me the same Taylor series. Simply, there's no requirement that that series converges, or if it does, that it converges to the function. It's just a function. So c infinity means the function has a Taylor series at every point or at the point you're looking at. And that Taylor series doesn't have to converge. If so, it's simply asymptotic. And the meaning of asymptotic is if you take six terms, then the remaining error is O of the next term. Well, that's exactly what it means here. But for some reason, nobody finds that scary, and lots of people find this scary. I've never known why. And most people haven't made the connection that the word smooth, which is very familiar, is the same as asymptotic uh, expansion. So that's just a word about not being frightened, but also I find that an amusing remark. Most of you will probably say, I would never make that mistake. Of course, it's the same. But I assure you, many people worry about divergent series. What does it mean if it diverges? And nobody worries about a function of being smooth at a point in the power series doesn't converge. It's not analytic. That's as familiar as, as pi. So that's one comment. Another comment is that for everything I do, some of the techniques I describe I found numerically because I do numerical computations more or less every day. And so should you, most of you, if you're probably any sort of mathematician or mathematical physicist, no matter how abstract you might be doing you know, something to do with algebraic geometry of multiplied spaces, there are always sequence of numbers that you want to understand. And if you do calculate, then I highly recommend, many of you know it, that you use the, it's called either GP or Paris or both, or with small letters or big letters. It's the program developed originally by Henri Cohen, whom I'll mention a few times, and later co-authors, co-collaborators like Karim Bellabas, Bill Talambert, Bill Alambert, excuse me. And it's an absolutely wonderful program. And there's a fantastic book written by our colleague, whom actually I don't see he was going to come, Fernando Villegas, wrote a beautiful book of experimental methods in number theory, where he explains many things deep, elementary and deep in number theory. And each one is illustrated by program in Paris. So if you don't know it, I highly recommend you can download it for a, a, a Mac, a, you know, Windows, a Unix, uh, even for a smartphone, anything you want. It's free, and it's extremely easy to learn how to use. So as I explain methods here, if you enjoy them at all, try to work out an example numerically, because everything's about numerics, and you can't do it in your head. I mean, nobody can do 20-digit calculations with a 1,000 numbers in their head. So the other general comment is this: there is a numerical side of all of this, and you should 
taken seriously. There's nothing wrong with numerics. It's not the deepest mathematics, but mathematics doesn't work without numbers, or at least a lot of mathematics doesn't work without numbers. So that's two general things. So as I said, I want to give various topics in the course, during the course. And I have eight main ones, of which a couple are less main. And, and I might not get to them. They're at the end. And it's less important. And some are kind of central. And some I'll give uh, and then come back to later with more de detailed examples, depending on time and depending on how things evolve. So let me say, so there are going to be eight main topics. But if you count, you'll very soon see that there are, I, I put 10 numbers, because I'll start with 0, which is not, the numbers will go from 1 to 8. But there's a 0. And the 0 is why uh, one reason, one of many reasons, why one should care about asymptotics at all. So asymptotics have an application. The rest will be about how to do asymptotics. But first, I want to say an application, which is very well known to many number theorists, but usually not to num num number theorists and not to all number theorists. And this is special values of Dirichlet series, or L series, or zeta functions. So the generic word is Dirichlet series, or Dirichlet, uh, or you can also call them L series, or L functions, or uh, various kinds of zeta functions. All of those are more or less synonymous, maybe in slightly different contexts. So let me start here before I get to the main topics, 1 to 8. Uh, by making a comment, this is another thing that I find amusing about people being afraid of one thing and not afraid of another, thinking one is easy and one is harder, but often getting wrong, which is the easy one, which is the hardest one. So Euler found, uh, actually this was in 1749, so 15 years after the previous discovery, which I'll come to in a second, Euler found that if you take what's now called, for reasons that escape me entirely since it's Euler's function, the Riemann zeta function, he found that in particular zeta of minus 1 is equal to minus a 12th. So this is the mysterious, so here's Euler's mysterious formula. And in his paper of 1749, which is French and, and a lot of fun to read, he writes that, you know, my readers will probably think I've gone crazy because zeta of minus 1, remember zeta of s if you're not a number theorist, but I think everyone has seen the Riemann zeta function, even if they don't realize it's the Euler zeta function. It's this sum. So zeta of minus 1 is simply the sum of all the natural numbers. And so Euler says the reader will probably think I'm crazy, since there are three obvious things about this sum. The first is that it diverges, that it's infinite. That's pretty obvious. The second is that it's positive. We're adding up positive numbers. The third is that it's integral. We're adding up integers. But no, the answer is finite. It's negative, and it has a, a denominator. But then he said, I hope in the course of the paper, I'll convince my readers that this is not nonsense. And he does. And some of you may have heard, again, I don't see him. He said he might come, our, our boss. Or is he there? I can't see. Atish. Yeah, I can't recognize people because I said, now I can recognize between the mask and my nearsighted. I was going to say he was going to come, but he's not here, but he is here. Hi. So uh, Atish is a wonderful lecturer as well as uh, being our big boss. He uh, gave a course of lectures a couple of years ago, three years ago, I don't remember, on quantum field theory, a wonderful introduction. I wish I could remember everything he said or even half of it. But he started, he motivated the whole thing by showing how this crazy formula of Euler's has a meaning in quantum field theory and how it can lead you to understand things. So it was, if you can find notes on it, I'm sure it's recorded. It's somewhere. Those lectures are really worth listening to again. So that's the most mysterious. But then Euler's earlier formula, so the same Euler who apparently uh, ostensibly hadn't discovered the Riemann zeta function, was showed 15 years earlier that zeta of 2 is pi squared over 6. I've told this story many times and probably sometimes here, and some, some of you have heard me say it, but it, it bears repeating. How did Euler find this formula? Yes? I'll come back to that after. Well, OK, I'll come back to that after. But now I want to first tell the, the story. Anyway, I'm going back in time, his first paper. So the story of this. Uh, this formula, he was a young man. He was born in 1706, so he was 28, so not super young. 
But this made him famous all over Europe. This is the th thing that, and the reason was this problem was a famous problem. It was called the Basel problem. Because a mathematician, I didn't look it up, it's Pietro Bo, Bocolati or something, somebody with a very Italian name, but he was in Basel. He had posed this question uh, 80 years earlier. So he had seen that the sum, one over n squared, so one plus a quarter plus a ninth, it converged. That's very easy because you can compare it with another series that obviously converges. And you could easily approximate it just by you know, eyeballing it like that. The same people didn't say it's about 1.6. If you were really careful and took 100 terms and didn't make mistakes, you might get around 1.65. But nobody had any idea what the number was. And this problem had attracted the attention, in particular, of the Bernoys, one of whom was Euler's teacher. So it was a very well-known problem. And Euler solved it. And the way he solved it is a wonderful illustration of, first of all, how you know, really taught mathematicians think and work. It's a mixture of intuition and and, and knowing how to proceed. But it also illustrates several of the topics of this course. Because the first thing is he did, he wanted to compute the number to 20 digits so that he could recognize it. But if you take this and you just stop at capital N, then the error is easily seen to be about 1 over N. So if you just take 100 terms, you, you get it within 1%. So even if you don't make a mistake, but it's not easy when you're working by hand, you get around 1.64 plus or minus 100th. Euler invented a method, which I'll talk about today or, or next time, which you've certainly all heard of and most of you know, called the euler maclaurin summation form. I think it was Euler originally. And he invented it more or less for this purpose. And using that, using only something like 20 terms of the series, he could calculate 20 digits of this. And that's typical of the extrapolation methods I'll be talking about. You have a small, num a small amount of information, but you extrapolate more intelligently than just stopping and saying the last value is very close. So he got it to Euler. There were three steps. One, calculate numerically to 20 digits. That was not at all obvious, and nobody knew how to do it. And so you get, I don't remember the number. It starts, I think, 1.6449, but lots of digits. Then second, and I'll talk about that too. That'll be in my list of topics. It'll be 3A, I think. Recognize it. So there are many mathematicians, probably including most of you, who could look at the number 1.6449 dot, 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 and say, well, that's a nice number, and would not say, oh, I know that number. That's pi squared over 6. But Euler was not one of those. He said, oh, that's pi squared over 6. And then he proved it, but that took him several years. The proof was, I mean, the big thing was the discovery, and to realize this is the answer to the Basel problem. So now coming back to what people think is easy and hard, I know many mathematicians, when they see this formula, say, oh, yeah, Euler couldn't have known about that because they don't know their history, because you need analytic continuation. And that requires complex function theory. Actually, Euler looked at the function only on the real axis, but he did it completely correctly for all s positive and negative. He found, by the way, the functional equation. He discovered it as a conjecture. He said, I'm sure it's true. And he calculated numerically when s was 1.5 and minus 0.5 that the relation he predicted, which he had proved for integers, was true. And he said, someday somebody will prove this will be important. And that when Riemann did prove. So Euler, so people now think, ah, to get this mysterious formula, I start with pi squared over 6. We all know that Euler proved that a long time ago. Then you use the functional equation. Then you deduce this. That's completely backwards. It's triply backward. Of those three statements, this one, this one, and the functional equation, this is by far the easiest. You can prove it in two lines. This is much harder. This one, by the way, Euler did in his paper just by hand. You have to explain, of course, what it meant. And he gave, I'd rather not answer the question. I can tell you probably he gave two completely different approaches, how to make sense of it. And both of them uh, led to an answer, well, not just for minus 1, for also minus 2, minus 3. And he calculated up to minus 40 and found the Bernoulli numbers. And both methods gave the same number. And he said, I hope you're convinced that even though what we're doing is not standard analysis of you know, 1749, it is, in fact, correct mathematics. And later, with complex analysis, it made sense. But this is way the easiest formula. This is considerably hard and took Euler several years to prove. And the functional equation, Euler discovered, tried very hard to prove it, stated as a conjecture with a numerical example, and said it'll be open. And that was proved by, Euler, by Riemann in 1859. So it took 110 years. So the functional equation is way the hardest of the three. And so to use the really easy statement from a much harder one and yet much harder functional equation is not good thinking. But it's because we all learn this form the first, because a high school student can understand this. And then we learn about the functional equation. And then we learn about this. 
So that's a side comment. But why do I say it's connected to asymptotics? And that's because it's a theorem. I'll give the proof later. It's very, very easy. Let L of S be any Dirichlet series. So that means it has an expansion, the sum n from 1 to infinity, cn over, lamp, over n to the s, where cn grows at most like some power uh, of n. So this converges in some half plane. It converges somewhere. OK? And you want to know, it does it have an analytic continuation, and does it have val interesting values at negative interest? I'm talking about special values. It, by the way, this can be more general, or it can be a generalized uh, Dirichlet series which means uh, the sum cn over lambda n to the s, where the lambda n's then have to go to infinity, at least like a power of n, and the cn, there's some growth condition to make it converge somewhere. But let's not worry. It's the same method. OK, and so what do you do? You define an associated power series. Uh, well, I'll call it a power series because it's the sum. You take the same coefficients, and you put cn x to the n. But it's convenient that x should be less than 1. And so it's convenient to call it e to the minus t. So let me call it e to the minus t. Then it doesn't look like a power series, but like a power series in e to the minus t. OK, this, of course, converges for t positive, because since the c's have to grow at most polynomially, and e to the minus nt decays exponentially, this will always converge absolutely. And now the statement, unfortunately, I'm too short to write at the top, but I can try. So this is a theorem, easy theorem. If phi of t, which is defined for all positive t, so you make a graph. And let's say that it has a smooth, remember, c infinity at the origin. It'll be analytic for t strictly positive because of the locally uniform absolute convergence. But it's here it might converge. If f of t has an asymptotic expansion, a0 plus a1t plus uh, a2t squared and so on, uh, as t goes to 0 from above, not necessarily convergent. It can diverge. So it's simply a smooth function. Then two statements. One, L of S continues analytically to all of C. So uh, however the function looked originally, of course, you have to know this, and you may or may not. But if you know that, then you have this for free. Let me keep the definition of L of S here. And secondly, L, the, the values at negative interest, including zeros so in the French sense, maybe Italian sense, uh, so if n is a non-negative integer, then the value of L of minus n up to a sign is n factorial times a n for all n. That's simply always true, and it's a very simple statement. And so that already tells you one reason, especially if you're a number theorist or an algebraic geometry. In modern number theory and algebraic geometry, everything is about zeta functions and their special values. That's the key to understanding practically everything. So you can't always evaluate, but when you can, you're happy. And this is a case when you can if all these nice things happen. More generally, let me give the more general in a second. If, if L of S, if, sorry, phi of t, has the same expansion, but it also has a, a pole term, so the wrong expansion. Then one prime is that L of S is equal to, it has a simple pole that S equals 1, and the residue is just this number. And so what's left is an entire function. It has no poles anywhere. So in other words, L of S extends meromorphically to the entire complex plane. It has a unique pole. The pole is to S equals 1. And it's simple. And its residue is A minus 1. That's four statements right there. And 2, 2 prime is simply equal to 2. So this is 1 prime. But 2 prime is the same. You don't have to subtract off this term. The values of L of minus n at non-positive integers are uh, given by the same formula. So as, as an example, let's come back to z of minus 1. If I have z of s is the sum 1 over n to the s, so phi of t is the sum uh, 1 times e to the minus nt, which is a geometric series. You can sum it immediately. And this, of course, we know the expansion. It's t, uh, I guess, minus 1 half plus dot, 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 and you get Bernoulli numbers. And so if you apply this, you immediately see that zeta of s has an analytic continuation to the whole plane, except for a simple pole of residue 1 at s equals 1. And the values at negative integers, 
such as eight of minus one is essentially the same as the Bernoulli numbers, which here would be B2, which is a sixth, and there's a, an extra minus a half. So it's essentially the Bernoulli numbers which are defined by the expansion of that function around t equals zero. So this is a very, very simple thing to prove, but it gives you one uh, motivation to care about asymptotics, that if you know the asymptotics of series, and if you're lucky, if you know for this particular series, then you get for free special values of Dirichlet series, which is, as I say, a kind of a key theme in, in number theory. Okay, so that was the topic zero. At this rate, I will need an infinite amount of time to get eight topics, but there won't be any more unnumbered topics, I promise, or fa fake, fake numberings. So let me say some of the uh, things. I should also keep an eye on the clock. When do I start? Four, I started, right? So it's been half an hour. I will try to make a break after around three quarters of an hour, but if I'm in the middle of a thought, I might, uh, you know, it might be a little later, and if I forget, please remind me. So the first one, I have to look at the order because I kept changing my mind. This is something that's extremely useful to know, and it comes up all the time asymptotics of functions of a very special form. Checking just my notation. So let's say g of x is the sum n from 1 to infinity. And most functions that you see in life are not given by closed form like sine x over e to the x minus 3. They're given by an infinite sum. But let's say that that infinite sum is there's a fixed function f is a fixed function, so it doesn't change, but you evaluate it at x, 2, x, 3, x, and so on. So that's an extremely frequent sort of infinite series that you see the nth term is simply the first term with, with some variable replaced by n times that variable. So that's a big class, and it's very useful. So this has many, many applications, and so many that probably I don't want to start listing them today, but when I come to that topic, which will be very soon, like maybe next time since it's topic one, I'll give some of them. But maybe one of them, I'll give one. But this, top, this thing is very connected with the zero thing, which I just erased. Because, for instance, if you see that if f of x, well, I should have called it then t, is e to the minus x, then g of x is exactly the sum e to the minus nx that we just used, which is 1 over e to the x minus 1. But it's also the sum, the geometric sum that corresponded to, the, to finding the analytic continuation of the Riemann zeta function. And in that case, the, the general formula for this is, is basically just uses Bernoulli numbers. So I might still today, at the end of the day, at least come back to this, begin with this. And the beginning statement is a rough statement about the asymptotics of this. So here, as x goes to 0. So what are the assumptions on f? f should be reasonably small at 0, at infinity. Let's say it's O of 1 over x to the c, with c bigger than 1, just as an example then the sum will at least converge, just, just to get the ball rolling. But often, f is very small at infinity. It's e to the minus x. But that's not really the problem. The problem is f might have some uh, smooth behavior. It might even have a, have a pull. I mean, the method has many variants. You can allow logarithmic singularities, all kinds of singularities at the origin. And what we're doing, this is f. And of course, I want this as x goes to 0. So since x is small, you're taking the value f of x, f of 2x, f of 3x, so you're taking the sum, it's, and the sum will converge because f is small enough that the integral converges. And so this is, you know, the, the width of these uh, strips is x, which is going to zero. And so you can see in your head the rough asymptotics is roughly, just by Riemann's definition of the integral, is a Riemann integral, it's roughly i over x, where i, which is, well, it's a functional, so i of f, is simply the integral from zero to infinity f of t dt. So indeed, that's true. But you would like to have you know, the entire asymptotics. And it's, it's very easy. And uh, I'll explain it. But as I said, there are many variants, like when f does have other singularities and so. So basically, the answer is given by the same formula that I already mentioned, uh, except there it was for convergence sum here. It's typically not by the Euler-Maclaurin formula, Euler-Maclaurin summation formula. Uh, in a slightly non-standard form. In a, it's not very different from the usual, but it's not quite the way one's slightly uh, 
non-standard version form. So it's not a very deep thing, but uh, as I said, there are variants. One of the variants is what if f is a singularity of the origin I already mentioned, like 1 over squared of x or log x over squared of x. But another variant is what if you don't sum over f of nx, but you sum over f of n plus a third times x, so shifted sum. Then, you know, the asymptotics will be the same. The Riemann integral is the same. So the leading term will still be i over x, but the remaining terms will be different. So there are small things like that. And that, as I say, has many applications in both uh, physics and mathematics. So let me mention one briefly, uh, just uh, to, so in the application in mathematical physics, but that I won't give any details now. I'll give it when I come to it. Application in mathematical physics, or just in physics, in this case, it's basically just ordinary physics. This is a thing called the Casimir effect, which the physicists in the audience know. I'm not one of them, and I only know kind of the mathematical statement. It was discovered by the Dutch physicist Casimir, who discovered many beautiful things. And the problem, it was asked, by the way, by Eberhard Zeitler, who was a good friend. He died a few years ago. He was the founder of the second Max Planck Institute in mathematics. The first one was founded by my teacher, Hirzebruch in Bonn, and I was there from the beginning, and I'm still there. The second one was founded about 20 years later. It's called Max Planck Institute for Mathematics and the Physical Sciences, and it's in Leipzig rather than in Bonn. And the founding uh, director was Zeitler, who was a wonderful mathematician, but also a very good mathematical physicist, who was working on a six-volume introduction to quantum field theory for mathematicians. But he wrote so much detail. Each volume is 1,000 pages, and he only finished three completely, and the fourth was half finished when he died after you know, quite a few years. So he asked me, he said, you know, when you talk about this, the physicists talk about a function, which, well, I'll even put in the normalization, because why not? There's a minus 2 pi, which doesn't matter at all for what I'm going to say. But it's the sum, and this is really, it's the sum over all triples of integers. So you have some lattice, and here you take a quadratic form, L squared plus M squared, but it's, the last one has a coefficient, which traditionally would be lambda squared times n squared. But you take this, you take the square root of this expression. So it's obviously horribly divergent. There are infinitely many terms, and they're all going to infinity. So it's not a convergent series. And so the question was, uh, one, how to make sense of it. And secondly, compute it. And computing a function to me, can have two meanings, and here they both work, both numerically. So you give me a value of lambda, like let's say 1 or 1 1.2, and you ask me to compute it. After all, this series diverged. You can do some trick dimensional regularization to make it converge, but typically very slowly. And so you'll still only get two digits, but I always want you know, 20, 50, 100 digits. I want essentially unlimited precision with a reasonable amount of work. So first of all, numerically, so lambda given, and secondly, in tune with this topic of this course, asymptotically, uh, and there are two ways you can take the asymptotics. Lambda is here a positive number, so lambda might tend to zero, or lambda might go up to infinity. And in both cases, you can ask for the asymptotics. And I forget which one the physicists need when their plates come very close, whether it's small or large. But anyway, he said what you hear, what you read in physics textbooks, even for a physicist, is hair-raising. It's so not correct. I mean, it's not just that things diverge. Every single statement in every detail is wrong and, and completely wrong, makes no sense. But then they do their thing, and at the end, they get an answer that every physicist learns in every textbook. But, so he asked me once, we were just at a Max Planck meeting, can you look at this and make sense of it? And so in the end, I wrote a long appendix for his book. It's 25 pages where I explained some of the things I'll explain in this course. You can find on my web page, but it's better to read it after the course. You'll be bored. And so the answer is you can make sense. That I'll explain later. But I gave a little table. So here's lambda and f of lambda. Here I have a table of, I did it for point 0.1, point 0.5. I'll drop 1, uh, sorry, 1 and 10. And I compute it with this uh, method. I'm not going to write it out, but I have the numbers right here and on my web page. And uh, 200 and here, 220.762. But each of these numbers I give to 50 digits. So that's a proof that, that the method is working, except you might say, how do I know the 50 digits are right? Anybody can have their computer spit, spit out 50 digits between 0 and 9. 
like the wonderful repartee, this is not part of the course, my friend Hendrik Lenstra once gave a popular lecture, and afterwards somebody came up to Professor Lenstra, yes, you're a mathematician. How many digits of pi do you know? And he looked at him, and he said, all of them. What? Yeah, said Lenstra, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. <laughs> So it's a little like that. Anybody can make the computer print out 50 digits, but how do we know they're the right ones? This method, which I hope I'll show later, there's a free parameter t. And when you compute, you can set that t to be a half, one, two, and you get completely different. You get an infinite sum, very rapidly converged. You get 50 digits, but the terms are completely different. When you do it with different values of t, the sum, which is to 50 digits, is the same. All 50 digits agree. So these numbers are kind of guaranteed that they're correct. So that's the question of computing it numerically. So it's kind of amazing that this thing that doesn't even make sense, and you could imagine roughly subtracting some leading term and making it converge very, very slowly. But how do you compute it to high precision? And then the part, the other part was f of lambda was 2c over 3 times lambda inverse plus pi over 3 lambda, and then to all orders came from the method, actually, the, the error is exponentially small as lambda tends to zero. So in other words, the error here would be less than any power, power no matter how big, of lambda. And as lambda tends to infinity, it's uh, an, another constant, pi squared over 45 lambda cubed, plus some other constant, c prime, again, to all orders, actually with an exponentially small error. And both c and c prime are given explicitly, and one of them is the one you find in the physics textbooks. So here, you, a problem that at first doesn't even make sense, you can answer to extremely high precision. And this is the kind of thing I feel should be in the arsenal of every mathematician. You never know when you'll have a problem like that. You have some series that maybe doesn't even make sense, or it's converging extremely badly, and you want to make sense, and then there are tricks that will help you to do it efficiently. OK, so I won't go into So that's one application that I just described of uh, well, it's in the same paper. It's actually not a direct application because you can see this doesn't quite have that form, but it's very much in the same ballpark. And when I get to it, you'll see that the two belong together. Or as I say, there is this appendix to Seidler's book on my web page, and then both of them are explained in kind of the same context. It's not direct in application. OK, so then the second main topic, so maybe I'll give the first three, which are the most important, and then make a brief uh, talk, pause, or at least not talk for for five minutes. So the second is Cauchy's formula, which we all know, and, uh, and its applications. And the main application, well, it's almost the same thing. Again, these are kind of synonymous words, but in a different context. This is what's called, ever since Hardy and uh, Ramanujan, and later Hardy and Littlewood, and Rademacher, and many other people, the circle method. So. Uh, so the basic method, of course, is you use, maybe I'll, again, I'll take another board to write what you do. I think I didn't really quite finish the thought that I said at the philosophical part at the end, at the beginning. Well, there were several philosophical things. But one was that a power series can be both a function but also a formal power series. But when it's a formal power series, that's just equivalent to a sequence of coefficients. There's no difference. And the wonderful idea, one of the most important ideas in all of mathematics, was found by Euler when he invented the partition function. That's that if, conversely, you have a sequence of numbers, in his case, the partitions, and you want to understand them, you make a generating series. You make the sum a next to n. It may converge, it may not. In that case, it does, unless it doesn't. But you study that function. And the properties of that function will tell you the asymptotics of f of n and vice versa. Now, it may not work. No method always works. But it should be your absolute research uh, reflex. So some good advice if you're a younger mathematician, that matter, an older one, but then you probably know. If you encounter a sequence of numbers anywhere in mathematics, they're counting you know, the number of polytopes. They're counting whatever they're counting. They're integers, let's say, or they're some numbers. You always, no exceptions, you always write down the generating theory series and spend at least an hour or two thinking about it. Can you see anything? It may not work. One time in. Five, maybe it won't work. But four times in five, you'll make a lot of progress. You should always do it. It doesn't cost anything. You just think about the generating series. So sequences and generating functions are the same. But now if I 
subtly replace x by z, which, as we all know, is a complex number, whereas x is probably a real number, although you're allowed to have complex x and real z. If you do this, then, of course, we all know that if this is convergent in some domain around 0, and if I take any cur closed curve, but I'm going to take a, a circle of radius r, so convergent in a neighborhood of the closed disk z less than or equal to r, then, of course, Cauchy's formula tells us that if you simply divide f of z by z to the n plus 1, then all of the terms except the nth one for the same n will not be 1 over z. And those powers z to the i where i is not minus 1 have an integral, which is a power of z. And when you go around a circle, you just get 0. But only the 1 over z gives log, which gives you 2 pi. And so you have the formula that, of course, we all know very well, which is this. And here I'm integrating around the circle where z is, is r. But now if I put that into the formula and go to polar coordinates, then I get this formula, which is equally obvious. I'll integrate from minus pi to pi. And now I have f of r e to the i theta times e to the minus i n theta d theta. And of course, that's equally obvious for the same reason. If you write down that form, you substitute this series, then every term a n z to the n where n is not this n will have a power e to the i n theta where m is not 0. And the integral of a non-trivial power of e to the i theta around the circle is 0. So only the nth term contributes. And that will have the r to the n. So I have to divide by it. So both versions are completely familiar. And you don't even need complex analysis to see that you just write down the series and integrate term by term. So now the idea is you can choose this r. Nobody tells you what r has to be. So there are two main cases. Case one. F is entire. I remind you, entire means holomorphic in the entire complex plane. So then, it's, then you typically let r go to infinity. Because if it's entire, that means that the ans go rapidly to 0, because otherwise, more rapidly than any exponential. Because otherwise, there'd be some z where this would diverge. So the ans are very small. So if you take z reasonably small, you get nothing, because the series converges too fast. You have to take z very big. So you have to take a circle of large radius. So let r be well chosen. And that's the whole art of the thing. That's where it's the circle method rather than just Cauchy's form. This is always true for any r. But now you choose an intelligent r. And what you do is typically this thing, when you think of it as a function of theta, let's say it's real imaginary part, it'll have a maximum somewhere. It'll be very big in the neighborhood of some theta 0, which is typically 0. And then you look near that, and you approximate it by Gaussian. And then for the Gaussian, you know the integral. And then you approximate by Gaussian times x times x squared and so on. And you get a whole power series expansion. So that's called the method of stationary phase. So you choose, uh, you see, if you do it for some other r, which is not the best one, then you won't have this picture. Instead, there'll be an oscillatory thing, because there'll be an exponential with some non-zero complex number. And it'll oscillate, and it won't give you, there won't be a unique maximum that you can estimate. OK, and the other case is. F has radius of convergence uh, finite, then you can assume, say, equal to 1. So that's the typical case. So the ans might grow like at most a power of n, or go to 0 like a power of n. And then you let r tend to 1 from below. Because now we have a function that only converges strictly inside the unit circle. Here's 1. And in the circle method, typically it is infinitely many. Uh, singularities all around this circle at rational points, at points of rational angle. But usually the big singularity is at 1. And let's assume it is. And then you take a circle. And again, you take it very, very near that point. If you try to make your life easier by taking near this, you only get the first few coefficients. It's boring. So here, so here I take typically r equals e to the minus epsilon. And epsilon, you choose it. Also here, we chose the r to depend on n. So each time you have an n, you choose the right r. And here for each and you also choose the right r, so you choose the right epsilon. So I was going to give two examples of that. And since I've already used up my time, so here I'll give you example one. It's a lot of fun. And I was hoping to do it today. That's Stirling's formula. Of course, there are many ways to get Stirling's formula. We've all seen some of them. But this is not the usual integral that you approximate. It's a different way. And example two is my favorite. This was my discovery. It's that there's a trap. It's a proof of the amazing theorem that I discovered that way. 
that e is equal to the square root of 2 pi. Now, you might be very surprised you've never seen that form. And indeed, it's not true, of course. e is 2.72, and the other is 2.51. But if you apply the method blindly, you just apply it following the rules, you will get e equals square root of 2 pi. So there's a small trap. And I want to give those two examples to show how it works in practice, both how you get startings. So here I can say what the function is. Here, I'm going to take not n factorial Stirling's form that we all know. It's n factorial is roughly n to the n e to the minus n over the square root of, sorry, times the square root of 2 pi n. And if you want, times 1 plus 1 over 12 n plus, I think, the next term is 1 over 24 and so on. Now, using the extrapolation method that's going to be in my point 3, if you just take Paris or another program, compute n factorial for n going from, let's say, 1,000 to 1,030. You only need 30 values, but big ones. Divide by this, and then use that approximation. You get the first 20 coefficients of the series numerically. But in this case, you can also prove them, because, of course, there's a recursion. It's easy. So here, you don't take n factorial. We're going to get an asymptotic form for 1 over n factorial. Of course, then you can invert it. So here, I'm going to take z to the n over n factorial, which is, of course, a well-known function. It's simply e to the z. That's entire. And so now you take r very large. It turns out for the nth coefficient, you take r exactly equal to n. And if you want to do an exercise that's very instructive, sometime between now and, and Thursday when I'll do it, take a few minutes to try to work out how you would get Stirling's formula. And you can actually get as many terms as you want at the expansion just by applying Cauchy's method to this. Here you take r equals n. OK? But here you take an even easier function. Take the, this is a question nobody probably except me would ever ask. What are the asymptotics of the sequence 1? So the sequence is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Well, the asymptotics are pretty easy. It's just 1. But let's say we try to do it using this method. It's supposed to work. So the generating series of 1 is, of course, 1 over 1 minus z. And here you take r. I think, if I remember correctly, it's n over n plus 1. So it tends to 1. And it works beautifully, but if you do it naively, what you'll get is that you get a whole power series with a constant times the power series in one over n, but the constant term is e over the square root of 2 pi, but it's supposed to be 1. So something is wrong. So it's just a small warning. One should apply it judiciously and not completely blindly. OK, one is I've, I've gone well over. Maybe I make like a two or three minute, just I stop talking for a minute, erase the board. And then I might be, I hope that I can quickly list the other so I have eight topics, and I've listed two, but all the philosophy was at the beginning. I hope it will work. So we're supposed to go until 5.30, which is another 35 minutes. Yeah. Or we can use the time for a couple of quick questions. Yeah. Well, I'm not explaining these methods. This is a survey of what I'll do in the course. Uh, here, I, I told you the answer. R is n. Here, R is n over n plus 1. OK, the general method. No, I did explain the general method. You look at this function, which is a function of both R and n. And typically, the big uh, bump will be at, at 0. I mean, typically, if, you know, as, as things go to infinity, it'll be centered around 0 in most applications. I'm not saying it has to be. And so you just expand this. And so I can say, so typically, f of r e to the i theta will be a constant, which, of course, we know what it is, plus, and then, of course, there's a Taylor series in theta. But I can write that if I divide by f to the r is e to the something, which is the derivative, times i theta. And then, so I take the logarithm of f divided minus the logarithm of f of r. I'll get theta squared, and so on. And so here, there's some function a r. And here, there's some function b r, which it better be negative or I'm being big trouble. So because there's an i theta, so it's really i theta squared. OK? So now, this a r will depend on r. And it will go to infinity, typically, as r tends to infinity in this case or to 1 in that case. And now you choose it. Choose, and so it's a, thank you, I, it's a very good question. I will try to answer at least that much. Choose r. So this is typically an increasing function. Here's r, and here's a r. Choose a r such that a r is equal exactly to n. Because remember, I'm multiplying by e to the minus i n theta. And so now there's your stationary phase. There's no oscillation here. Theta equals 0. Otherwise, it would be i times some number, and its theta is very small. It would oscillate. You can't estimate that at all. But if you make a r equal to n, then that term goes away. 
The next term may be influenced by the rest of e to the i and theta, but it's something. And so what you're left with to the first approximation is e to the minus constant times theta squared. And that's a Gaussian, and the answer is the square root of pi over, over that constant. So that's how it works, and that's how you choose it. So actually, I urge them. In fact, I'm glad that I didn't get I prepared it, but I didn't get around to doing it today. Those of you who, who like to play with the fun problem, look at these two cases. You don't have to get two or three terms, just the very beginning. Try to see how if you apply that here, you will find you must choose R to be N, and you will get at least the beginning of Stirling's form, at least that much. And if you're braver, you can get the next term or the next two or three terms. And similarly here, see that if you just apply it without doing anything, you will get that E is the square root of 2 pi. And then the question is, find the mistake. Why, why isn't that a legitimate proof? Because of course, E is not the square root of 2 pi. So thank you, a great question. I first tried to avoid it, but in fact, I think I answered it. But you really see it. If you look at one of these examples, you can take lots of other functions of your own. Take some simple sequence that you know the generating function. So you happen to know both the ANs, like here, n factorial, we know very well, and one. But you also know in closed form the function. Then you can apply the thing, and you know what you're supposed to get, and you can see how it works. So that's, it's much better to first take such examples. And of course, later you want it for examples where you don't know the answer. You had had the question about Euler, but as I said, I, it's, it's a little hard to explain. I can give you wonderful advice if you read French, which you certainly do. Look at this. Well, I mean, you know Italian and, and Portuguese and French is just an interpolation. You use the interpolation method. It's absolutely wonderful. It's the, I think it's my favorite paper in all of mathematics because Euler, unlike Gauss, who tried to keep everything secret, he didn't want the reader to see how the great Gauss came up with his ideas. So he would wait years and then publish something with just the theorems and the proofs, kind of Bourbaki style, but worse. Euler was the opposite. He loved to explain everything. So he will say, you might think this is the right, and then he takes five pages where he says, I thought so too, and I did this, and he gives a numerical example, and in the end it doesn't work, like here. And then he says, you see, that's not how you should do it. Here's a better way, and maybe it's another paper. That's one reason why his collected works, it took 150 to 250 years, I think, to finish. It's 80 huge volumes, like encyclopedia volumes. He wrote an immense amount, but he explains everything. And the result is that until about 1900, Essentially, all good mathematicians, all the famous ones you've heard of, learned the mathematics by reading Euler, not from teachers. They all said, read Euler, he's the master of us all. That was the statement. Because he really explains why things go wrong. And he explains why you might think I'm crazy and why the method works. And his explanations are just wonderful. And then he shows you how it works. But of course, it's very naive because it's 100 years before we knew a complex function theory. And he's just working with real variables. But it still works very well. Any other question? Otherwise, I'll go on and use the remaining time. Uh, Don, Don, hi, Giuseppe Mussardo speaking. Oh, oh you're, you're, a, a, you're a voice in the, in the he from, heaven, uh, yes. Ciao, I'm from Sissa. Ciao, Don. Yeah. Ciao. So what's your question? Uh, the, the question is, uh, uh, I think at the bottom of all this method is just analytic continuation, right? No, absolutely not. So, and I don't want to get, Giuseppe, I don't want to get now into any philosophical. I've talked, first of all, all. I've only given two of the eight topics. Let me give all eight before you say that they have a common theme. But I don't think it's about analytic continuation at all. That's one of many, many, many themes, maybe one of 20. So basically, I, I, I don't think that's the right way to look. Of course, it's very important. And here, this is about analytic continuation. But many of our functions would be divergent. And then you can't use Cauchy at all, because the ANs make sense, but these are divergent power series. I'll come to that in a second. It's not about analytic continuation. That's certainly a theme, but it's, it's definitely not what's at the bottom of everything. So is that enough for okay. now? Anyway, I mean to call you tonight. Yeah, yeah it's enough for I now. I have to yeah. call you tonight we'll or what... tomorrow anyway about other subjects, and so then we can discuss at leisure. Thanks for the question, and your questions are always good, but here I... I think there's, there, you'll, you'll see that there's more, that that's only one aspect of, of what should be this whole course. So let me continue. I didn't really make a pause, but I let other people speak, so at least you got a pause from my voice. So three is the one that's in the, uh, in the announcement. I gave two of the examples. So how to recognize, this is super, super, uh, useful in, in real life. Uh, I use it, I would say, once a week for the last many years uh, for, you know, for problems from every field of mathematics that you can imagine. How to recognize the asymptotics of a given sequence of numbers. 
So, I mean, I already mentioned that before. Some days you have a machine that will produce numbers A1, A2, A3, let's say up to A1000. And they're growing roughly, and you want to see where, how are they growing. Do they have a limit, or do they grow like some power? So typically, you have AN. So typically, you know AN numerically, but to high precision. Maybe it's exact. Maybe it's an algebraic number, even a rational number, even an integer. You know AN for, let's say, N equals 1, 2, 3, up to 1,000. Maybe it's 2,000, but not up to trillions. And certainly not up to 10 to the 1 million. So, and you think, you, you expect, because you, you eyeball the graph, and you expect that a n, maybe there's even a power of n factorial. And even if there isn't, there is or there isn't, there may be an exponentially big term. And whether there is or there isn't, there can also be a pure power term. And then there might be some power series, c0 plus c1 over n plus c2 over n squared. So you think that that might be the case. And the problem, using just, let's say, a 1,000 coefficients, find lambda, alpha, beta, c0, let's say up to c20, to high precision. So really find when you say this is the exact value. And the method is very easy. It's a method I invented years ago, but it's certainly not new. It's equivalent mathematically to a method called Lagrange extrapolation. So that's Lagrange. It's equivalent to some of the physicists use called Richardson, I think also extrapolation. And it's equivalent to other things, but those are formulated, at least when I've looked them up in Wikipedia or so, in a way that to me is harder to remember and harder to understand. The way that I look at it, I'll explain when I get to this in the course, which will be very soon. This is the most fun part of the course. It's a very simple way. And I can already tell you the mnemonic. Some of the people here, including people who were in my course last year, have seen it. So the, the method, but it will make no sense unless I explain. Method, you multiply by n to the eighth. Eight doesn't have to be eight. You might multiply by n to the tenth, and then you do something. So you take this sequence, you multiply by some moderate, moderate power of n, and you do something. And it's, it's a lot of fun. I'll show lots of examples, not today, because it would take too much time. Of this, I could easily spend the entire six weeks giving you examples of this. I say I have, in my own work, it comes up uh, you know, once a week. And many of my friends who had a sequence, and I told them, and so I have beautiful examples from other people I know. So I have endless examples. I'd actually made a list, and maybe a couple of them I will give, because uh, all of them are fun, but when I get to it, I'll... Uh... So the first one, it's listed in the web page and on the announcement on the poster. So you take the sum, this was the sum Konsevich wrote down, which is a meaningless series, it, it diverges. Whatever Q is, except if Q is a root of unity, so you take the sum of what are called the Q-Pohammer symbols, so the product 1 minus Q to the i, i goes from 1 to n, and you sum that over all n. But this is a perfectly good formal power series, because if Q is very near to 1, uh, if Q is 1 minus epsilon, then the nth term here is divisible by epsilon to the n. So the series converges. And so we can write this, this sum for some historical reason. It's called xi d. It's a power series in 1 minus Q. And you can easily compute the first few values, and they start. I have them written down on the piece of paper that I just lost, 1, 1, 2, uh, 5, 15, 53. 15, 53. And so there's a fun story about this. I'll tell the story briefly. You know, when you see a sequence of numbers and you want to know how to recognize them, how do they grow, there are two methods. I've made this joke before. One is to look it up in the online handbook of integer sequences by Neil Sloan. And the other is to ask me. Both are good ways. If you ask me, I'll think about it, and a week later, usually I'll be able to say, I think your series grows like this, even if I don't recognize it. So here, uh, this series, which I'd found in some, it doesn't matter, in something to do with quantum topology, it was actually Maxim Konsevich who had written down these things and looked at them with me. Uh, I typed this into the you know, online handbook of integer sequences, and it said, I'm sorry, I don't know your sequence. So I thought, that's normal. I mean, it's, it's a new sequence. Then two nights later, I got an email from Neil Sloan, whom I happen to know. And he wrote, Dear Don, sometimes when I can't sleep at night, I take a cup of hot chocolate, and that helps me to fall asleep. But sometimes I don't take a cup of hot chocolate. I go to my computer, and I look who has been looking at my online sequence. 
And so last night I looked and I saw you had asked about this sequence. And so he was happy because he knew me. And he said, but you obviously didn't know is the computer doesn't allow two initial ones, which I told him is silly. If you put in the Fibonacci numbers, it'll say, I never heard of it. So he changed it. It removes the initial ones and still finds you. So he said, I added, I took away the first one in your series, and it found it. But to my great surprise, the definition it found was not my definition. It was something wildly different coming from not invariance. And uh, I wrote a paper in the end. I spent several pages showing that the series defined there and the series I'd found were the same. But in the meantime, that person in not theory, Stroimanov, had needed the asymptotics of this. And he had said that xi d, which was important for him to have wrote, seemed numerically at the first 30 values. I, I did simpler form, like I'd get like 200. He said it's roughly, it seems to grow factorial, like maybe d factorial over 1.5 to the d. With the asymptotic method, I could say this 1.5 is actually 1.6449, which I recognized because I knew from Euler that's 8 of 2, times square root of d times the power series. I gave the first several coefficients to many digits. And later, I found a closed formula. And the first coefficient, so it's actually not this. It turned out to be d factorial times the square root of d over pi squared over 6 to the d times a constant plus another constant. I found for several constants high precision. But C0, this I'll write out completely. I've lost track of where I am. 29595 to whatever number of digits that is. And later in the paper, I found a closed formula by, by theory. And it was this number. 12 squared of 3 over pi to the 5 halves times e to the pi squared over 12. And when I calculated that number numerically, it was this. Every single digit was correct. So the asymptotic method works. But my term, my 3a, which I won't write out, is the same. But how to recognize not a sequence of numbers, a number. So in this case, I didn't do it, actually. Now I think I would know how to do that. I had this number to lots of digits. I should have been able to say, aha, like Euler. I know that number. It's 12 squared of 3 over pi to 5 halves times e to the pi squared over 12. After all, Euler only used his head. I've called high-speed computers. And I can try 100,000 combinations. I actually didn't in this case. But in many cases, I have. I'll give you other examples. So that's a fun side thing. And when I show people numbers, then they say, that's magic. Only you could do it. But there's no magic. Once you know, there are a couple of tricks. And it's actually quite easy if you know roughly where to look to recognize the number. If you have any idea that this might involve these constants, then which combination you can find by computer. Of course, if you have no idea, you'll never find it. So that was the first example. And I had six examples that I'd prepared for today just to list the examples without saying the formulas. But that, then I won't finish at all. So I've. Several beautiful examples that come from combinatorial problems, problems of algebraic geometry, like uh, the second one is the number of lines take a hypersurface in projective n space. And if the degree is exactly 2n minus 3, then it has a finite number of lines by some kind of Schubert calculus. And that number of lines grows very quickly. And there's a formula, but it's a very horrible formula. And the question is to find its asymptotics. And that I found first with the asymptotic method. But in, the, in that case, later I found I, I had a proof. But it, it, well, everything was correct. But there are many, many other examples, including the two that I put on the website. So including this rather amusing uh, example, j plus 4 thirds over j to the power, I think, was minus 4 thirds. So a friend of mine asked me about a year ago. This series had come up, and he, he had a, a guess that maybe it was equal to something specific. But he had calculated this to five decimals using 30,000 terms. And his guess worked to you know, four or five decimals. He said, is that the exact answer? With the asymptotic method, using not 30,000 terms, which he used, it took a day. I used, I think, 250 terms. I could give this number to 300 digits. And it wasn't the number he guessed. I mean, there was no reason it should have been. It was very close, but it was, that was just an accident. So this comes up all the time. And I've, there are many fun examples, but I'll do that when I get to it. So this is, in a sense, the high point of the course, because this is the most fun and the most useful in everyday life. You have a sequence of numbers that comes up. It might be in the theory of multi spaces, some intersection numbers, some volumes, like the things Mezahani studied, or siegel veach volumes. And you want to know how they grow as a function of that. And you want to find the asymptotics, first numerically to high precision, and then high precision. And then sometimes you can recognize it. So those are the three kind of central topics. And then the others are 
much smaller, but they're fun, and they all fit with the theme of asymptotics. So I hope to get to all of them, or at least some of them. So I'll describe them more briefly. The next is called sum alt. And that's a very easy to understand, very fast. So it's incredibly fast, very accurate. It gives a huge number of digits. And I don't know if this is a word, memory light. I couldn't think of it. If you program it, uh, no matter how far you go, it uses O of one memory. You only have to store a, like eight numbers, and then you, you don't have to keep anything as, as you go. You throw them away. So you can on the fly. It's a method to compute alternating sums. That means sums of real numbers where the, typically the terms go maybe very slowly to zero, but they alternate in signs. So we all learned as undergrads that that means it converts to something. Uh, so you want con series numerically, but as I said, very high precision. And this is joint work of f five people. The first is Euler. The second is a Dutch mathematician I certainly never met called Van Weyngarten. The third is Henri Cohen. Uh, whom I mentioned before, is the developer of Paris. The fourth is Fernando Villegas, who's here in ICTP. And the, th the last is me. And it's, of course, not joint work. We, uh, some of us lived in different epochs. Uh, Euler invented the method, but in a form that you could never implement. But of course, there were no computers anyway. Van Weyngarten, sometime in the 20th century, had a verse that you could implement. It's very inefficient, but it does work. And then Henri Cohen found a tremendous improvement. And when he was visiting Viegas, or Viegas was visiting him, uh, he showed him. And Viegas said, oh, but you can improve that even more. And then they're both good friends of mine. They showed me. And I found another trick. So there were four successful improvements of what was basically Euler's idea. And we have a little paper. It's even on my website. And it's now programmed in Paris. It's a lot of fun. It works very, very fast. And if I don't get to it, it's fun. You can just look at my website, the joint paper with Cohen and Viegas, and see how it works, and, and lots of examples. So, but it's, it's an incredible method. The program in Paris is one line. And it has absolutely nothing to do with what the function is. So you just have some function minus 1 to the k, a k, where the a k's are going to 0. And you plug that in the computer. If you take 200 terms, you just, so let's say you only know 200 terms, because that's all you've computed. Then you just, since it has to be linear, it's just how, you have to predict some combination. And so it just tells you what combination of the first 200 is the optimal combination to predict this value. And it gives an incredibly good approximation. If you take that approximation, it's very, very close to the truth. And of course, if you have more terms, it'll be better. So that's kind of fun because it's, it's a universal form. It doesn't, of course, always work, but it works for a large class of functions. Then I have three final topics. In fact, now I can start sl speaking more slowly because I still have 15 minutes. So I can take five minutes for each. But it's also nice that at the end we have five or eight minutes for questions, questions and answers. But you can also always ask the next time before I start at the beginning. It doesn't have to be at the end. So that was number four. I nearly skipped. OK, number five. Now this is a thing some of you will know, because I gave a course last year, also a joint ICTP and CISA course, that quite a few of you attended or heard. And there I told this method because it was needed, and part of it we developed in the joint work with Garofalidis that I uh, presented in that course on quantum knot invariance, but it comes in many different places. So this is making numerical sense of factorially divergent series. So what does that mean? Now you do exactly what I said you shouldn't do. You have a divergent series, some a and x to the n. Let's say you know the a n's, or you have some algorithm to generate lots. You know experimentally, or by the extrapolation method, or theoretically, that a n grows roughly like n factorial to the 1. So this lambda is 1, but the other coefficients may be there. And you want to know what is f of, for instance, 0.001. I mean, if x is 100, it doesn't make any kind of sense because the terms go very rapidly to infinity. But what happens if x is 100? Well, the first few coefficients, so you'll have n, and then you'll have a, and maybe the first few coefficients, well, let's say it's exactly n factorial. Then here you'll have 1, 1, 2, 6, 20, uh, 24. They're not that big. I mean, they're very big if n is very large. And if f is this, then an x to the n, 
uh, this is 0.001, 10 to the minus 3. This is, sorry, this is 1. This is 10 to the minus 3. This is 2 times 10 to the minus 6. This is 6 times 10 to the minus 9. It's still very small. This is 24 times 10 to the minus 12. It's still very small. So at the beginning, the terms, of course, are getting smaller. No matter how quickly the ends, ends increase, the first 20 are finite if, if x is small enough. So at some point, if you look at the terms, they get smaller and smaller, and then they start going to infinity. So the obvious thing to do is you just stop at the optimal stopping point with the terms of the minimal. This has been done by mathematicians through the ages and by mathematical physicists. It's very important in, in a quantum field theory and already in easier in quantum electrodynamics. And so, for instance, the, the magnetic moment of the electron is a constant that's been computed to, I don't know, 12, you know, more, maybe 18 decibels, and it agrees with the theory. So there's a theory. And the experiment, if you do it in the lab, you get something in both. They can get about, I think, 17 or 18 digits, so huge accuracy. And they agree. But the theoretical method is you have a sequence of Feynman diagrams. And it's a power series. And I think the fine structure comes, which is like 1 over 140. So at the beginning, it converts. And if you take like six terms, then that's about when it gets to the minimum. And that's all that you can compute anyway, because the Feynman diagrams with more and more loops are, uh, become uh, intractable. But when you do that, you get a very, very high precision number. And so you can use the naive thing is just, so where am I here? You can use optimal truncation. You just stop. You just replace the sum by the sum from the n optimal, which means the one where, let's say it's exactly n factorial. Then if you change n by 1, n increased by n, x to the n increased by x, so you want nx to be 1. So you take n to be 1 over your number. In my case, x was 1,000. You would go to the 1,000th term and stop. And then the error will be exponentially small rather than merely a fixed power of x. But there's an improvement, actually several improvements that I called, or we called smooth optimal truncation, improved smooth optimal truncation, where you get still exponentially good converters, but with bigger exponents, e to the minus constant times n, but with a bigger and bigger constant. You can't make the constant go to infinity, but you can beat the optimal truncation by quite a lot. So that's quite a practical thing in real life. This comes up often that you have a series, uh, all series coming from quantum field theory in any form, so from Feynman diagrams. And ours were not physics, they were topology, but they are given by Feynman type integrals. They always have this factorial divergence, that's typical. And so if you want to evaluate them numerically, it makes sense that you have to do this. Then another topic which is uh, sounds similar. That's if you have a very divergent series, so super divergent series. So, e.g., you have some series a n x to the n, and a n is roughly. I mean, there may be further terms, powers of n, and exponentials, but it's roughly, f, for instance, n factorial squared, or some bigger power than the first. So, this, for the people who know that terminology, it's called Chevrolet class. One, class two. And then this is something I did in joint work with Martin and Miller. So it's in our, uh, sorry, with Chen and Miller. We have two papers, that with Davey Chen and, and Martin Miller. We found that actually much better things, this is now not about numerical evaluation, this is about formal series. It turns out these actually behave better than simply factorial series. So for instance, if you have a series like this, you know, the asymptotics of an, and let's say it starts x plus dot, dot, dot. Then, of course, you can take the inverse series. There'll be some other series with some other coefficients, bn, x to the n. And it turns out you can give the exact asymptotics of bn from the exact asymptotics of an. You can't do that if it's convergent or even simply factorially divergent. It's a sum of many terms, and they interfere with each other. But here, because of the rapid growth. So it's a fun thing. It's a small topic. But I may say something that these super divergent series, in some ways, behave better. They don't make any kind of sense numerically, I mean, at least. The, Typically, you can't, there's no function that you know, sometimes there is, that has that asymptotics. But it's formal power series, they have these beautiful properties. And in our cases, these n were combinatorial numbers coming from what I mentioned already, Siegel Veach volumes uh, and Siegel Maser volumes of, of moduli space. It's some fancy invariant in the theory of moduli space of curves. And it has to do also with the dynamical systems and so on. So that's very rapidly divergent series. Then in the opposite direction, you've Convergence series, so you might say, what's to ask if it converges? You just look at it. But what if they're super slowly convergent? And so there, the basic example was suggested you know, a century ago by Hardy and Littlewood. I believe that's their example. And it's mentioned in the 
announcement on both the poster and on the website. It's the sum n from 1 to infinity, so let's call this f of x. It's 1 over n times the sine of nx. Well, there's absolutely no problem with the convergence. Whatever x is, n is eventually bigger than x. It's going to infinity. Once x is bigger than n, x over n is small. Oh, sorry, sine, not x. That wouldn't work at all. Excuse me. Sine of x over n. Excuse me, I wrote nonsense. If n is very big, x over n is very small. So sine x over n is roughly x over n. Then the whole of the nth term is roughly x over n squared. And we all know that 1 over n squared converges. But the problem is, what if x is 10 to the 30? Well, of course, you could take your computer and let n run from 1 to 10 to the 31. And then the rest you could approximate by what I just said very slowly. But no computer in the world can do 10 to the 31 terms. And the age of the universe is 10 to the 13 or 10 to the 14 years. And a year is 10 to the 7 seconds. And a computer does 10 to the 7 operates per second. You're not even close. So you can't just do it directly. And the problem is the small terms, the first 10 to the 10 terms, this is essentially random because x is a huge real number. And so you divide by n and reduce mod 2 pi. It's essentially a completely random number. Now, it's true that the sum random number over n converges. 1 over n doesn't, but a random number, because of drunken man's walk, will converge. But it's incredibly slow. It'll converge like in a square root of n. So you'll never get anywhere that way. And so when I, if there was a colleague of mine in Bonn, a physicist, Monin, very uh, mathematically, very astute physicist. He asked me, and we spent some time thinking, and I spent more time, and I came up with four different methods. If, if x is fairly big, much bigger, very big, and even huge, and it does work, I probably will never get to it in the course. That's problem one. Problem two, I can't find my notes. I looked for them in Bonn. Then I hoped I'd take them with me to China, and they were in my luggage, but they aren't, and they're not in China, and they're not in Trieste, so I don't know where I put them. So I would have to reconstruct it for my computer programs, which would take time. Anyway, I'll never get that far in the course. And on top of it, this never comes up in real life. It's a beautiful theoretical example due to two great analysts. But this is not a practical problem. You will never see a series like that in, in your practical mathematical life. And the last, I'll just mention the name. It was supposed to be the name of a joint paper with Cohen and Bellabas, who were the, uh, the authors of Paris. And in the end, they just included it in some numerical thing. We didn't write it up carefully. But we were going to call it magic constants. And it's a fun thing, but I probably won't get to it, and it is no special uh, application in this course, uh, for well, the title was for Lagrange extrapolation, which I already mentioned is a method that is mathematically equivalent to the one I'm going to describe in the course, but formulated very differently. And so when you do it, things converge rather unstably, and there are various constants in asymptotic expansion. So you could try to study what they look like and get nice firmness, and they call those magic constants. So that might be an eighth topic. So I'll probably not get to this, and I very likely won't get to this, or only very briefly. So it's 1724, which means I'm finished with my overview. There's no point starting on one of the eight topics now. So if anybody has questions now, it would be great. And otherwise, we can just go home. No one? Everything was super clear or just, yeah. Sorry? Oh, no. Well, this I said, there is a paper. I don't know where it is. Uh, it's, I don't know why you would want to read, unless you've studied the Lagrange extrapolation method. I don't know why you'd be interested. Uh, they have a paper somewhere. Actually, they wrote a joint book, but I don't know if it's already finished, on numerical methods. And there they have a section they included and thank me that I helped them work it out. But in the end, we didn't write a joint paper. But it's not a major thing. I mean, I'll never write a paper on that. And this, I, I told you that my notes I can't even find. I don't even have it handwritten. And it's certainly not published. So there's no reference. And even my notes, I spent two hours looking in Baden. Then I called the secretary in Shenzhen. I thought maybe I left it there to send to Trieste. But she checked, and with the we, WeChat, she photographed, uh, showed me all of the papers I'd left. And it was lots of math, but it wasn't the calculus with Monin. And I have no idea where those notes have gone. So I don't have even my own reference. So no, I can't give reference. Some of these things are written, one or two I mentioned. When I get to it, you can always ask if there are convenient references. I usually prefer to have no references when I tell the story, and then at the end say you can read more. 
because otherwise people read first and then you've seen a different point of view and it's better to, to hear it you know, with a fresh mind and then uh, see it worked out formally. But of course, in some cases, I've revealed where the things are published. Anyone want to ask? Yes, please. Oh, no, of course not, because for that, uh, the physicists would have to tell me the next uh, 20 terms of the series. And they can't, actually, it's even worse. As far as I looked, looked that up, I asked a physicist friend, the actual optimal truncation, if you estimate, you would have to take, let's say, seven terms, but they can only get up to fifth, five loop diagrams. So they actually don't even optimally truncate. They just stop when, when they don't know the next term. They only have like five terms. And no matter how smart you are, you cannot extrapolate to asymptotics with five terms in a series. It's just not enough information. I mean, five things you can continue any way you want. You need 50 terms. So I have many applications in the work with Garofalidis. We typically have cases where we can compute Let's say something we could compute, I remember one with a lot of trouble, 67 terms. One we could get 150, one we could get 35. But this was some as days of computation. So typically the terms are hard to get, but still we have 30, 40, 50, 100, not four, four or five. And then we could get numerical values, and when things made sense, we could check that they were giving us true things. So there are numerical applications, but not, not for that, because the Weinman diagrams, no one knows. Even the next two terms, I think they don't know. So it's suboptimal truncation. So optimal truncation, you go until the terms start getting bigger. But they have to start earlier because they don't know the next two terms, I think. I mean, a physicist should check if I'm, I'm aligning them. But I'm pretty sure that they, at least at the time when this famous computation was done, the number of terms they had, in principle, if they could do more of the theory using some huge supercomputer to compute the next Feynman diagrams, they could get maybe two more terms and predict theoretically another three or four decimals. But there's not too much point if you're a physicist, because how do you know they're correct unless you can do the experiment? And the experiment at that time was at the absolute limit of what experimental technique could do. So it was beautiful because both numbers could give the same number. I forget whether it was 13 digits, 15. And they agreed to that precision. It was considered one of the triumphs of quantum electrodynamics. And, and the reason that people believe that quantum theory and standard models and so on are working, because this was a wonderful numerical check. But both you would like to get, of course, 20 years later, you would like to get two more decimals. But I don't know if that's ever happened. So a physicist can tell you. I don't know. But usually, our situation is these are well-defined numbers. And you can, in principle, compute as many as you want. But as many as you want might be 100 or 200. It's not you know, thousands, but it's also not just four or five. So Feynman diagrams, you, you can't compute. I mean, they get hopeless. You know, seven-loop Feynman diagram is, I mean, there are a, a, a huge number of, 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 of graphs already. So it's a sum of many, many contributions, and each one is horrendous to calculate. It's, it's a many-dimensional integral, and so you, know, you just can't do it. Now we only have one minute, so we could even reasonably call it a day. But if somebody still has a question, feel free. You can also ask me privately. I have an office here, as many of you know, if you're at ICTP, and I'll be in essentially every day. So you can always come and knock, and I'm always happy if I'm there. I'm equally happy if I'm not there, but you won't notice it. OK, so then till Thursday, same time, same place. And Thursday, I'll actually start, and there'll be some mathematics or some examples, not just talk. And I'll also do the um, Stirling's formula and the proof that e is the square root of 2 pi, just so that you see. Uh, but I hope by that time, some of you will have thought about why it isn't. <laughs>